Welcome to Bruce Hurwitz Presents Meet the Experts. I'm your host, Bruce Hurwitz of Hurwitz Strategic Staffing. You can find us on the web at hsstaffing.com. I hope you'll consider us for all your staffing, career counseling, and speech writing needs. I'm delighted that I'm going to be joined by Jeffrey Klein, and we're going to be discussing the importance of content marketing. Meet the Experts is sponsored by PK CPAs. PK is a full service accounting firm. They provide accounting and consulting services to business ranges from startups to small and mid cap companies to nonprofits, as well as high net worth individuals. Contact them today for a free consultation at info at pk cpas.com or call them at 973 882 8810. They will be happy to be of service. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Bruce. Appreciate being here. It's my pleasure. Please take a moment or two and introduce yourself to our viewers. Sure, Jeffrey Klein. I am a visual content producer. I help people tell their story through video and animation production. I am also an adjunct professor, an author, a speaker, and a happily married husband and father to three. Very good. I have to add, usually my first question would be, what is content marketing and how does it differ from regular marketing? But your website intrigues me. Nine dots. Mm -hmm. Nine dots media dot com. What are the nine dots? It's usually something I don't reveal, but I'll, I'll give you the, the crux of it. So it's Nobody based watches. on a puzzle. Go ahead. Just the answer. <laughs> uh, it's based on a puzzle. So when I was looking to name uh, uh, my company, I was looking through a lot of things. It's those nine dots that you connect with all with four straight lines without, yeah. without lifting your pen. And it's actually credited with the phrase, think outside the box. So I always say that my messaging is about, I help people connect the dots by thinking outside the box. I remember that in school. Yes. We had to do it. No one could get it. No, and it's, it's, it so and again, it's a, it's a the difference between, you know, kind of conventional thinking and, and trying to think, you know, being resourceful and, and thinking maybe there's a different way to do something. I remember he said to us, if you tell anybody, <laughs> all right. And it was one of those things that it was, uh, State secret, okay. we never okay, tell. Yeah, magician secret. That's well, it. I've had many people do it, and people who've even seen it still don't know how to do it. Like, they can't remember the trick yeah. or the thing. Um, but I, it's a game that's fun for me to play. It's, a, you know, I think it's engaging, and, and it's visual, and it's mm -hmm. kind of, and it does very well in terms of uh, my messaging, in terms of what I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to help people. So what is content marketing, and how does it differ from regular marketing? Uh, I would... I'm sure you get a bunch of different answers from a bunch of different people, but I'll give you my take on it. Uh, basically, I would say it's a subset of marketing and marketing can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, for me, it is about the consistent creation and sharing of uh, messaging to an audience. So it's about the the content that's created and then distributed to the people that you're trying to, to sell to you know, as, as a general way of being. Um, and Effective content marketing, I might as well put that, which is creating that consistency of relevant and valuable content to that specific audience. So the difference between just, you know, throwing something on the wall versus understanding who your audience is and then trying to provide them with something that's actually useful in one way or another. I'm going to ask and answer my own question. Sure. I was once concerned because every day I, autumn, I use Zoho. I used to use Hootsuite. I would post, I post four different messages on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. X, Facebook, whatever. And I was concerned that I might be overdoing it. So I stopped for a month. Mm -hmm. And traffic to my website dropped 80%. Then I resumed, and after about six weeks to two months, 
it was back to where it was before. So now I let it go and I discover that, yeah, most people have seen these things a thousand times and I may not be exaggerating, but the one person who's never seen it, it's for them, it's new. Now, do you agree that the content doesn't need to be changed? I have, uh, a, it depends answer. I hate to give those answers, but uh, the answer is sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there are a couple of different concepts that uh, I like to share with people. There was one in particular, we talk about evergreen content. So evergreen content, most people are familiar with. That's the kind of content that you can post today, tomorrow, in a year. You, you know, if you think about it, you know, we just had Halloween. Halloween is the same time every year, October 31st, so that you could create a Halloween post today for next year. And, you know, not necessarily change that much. And so, or use the same one you used from two years ago. And it's probably not kind of, so that's evergreen content. Then I believe there's a second category of content called what I call fresh cut content. And fresh cut content is content of the now. So something happens in the news or something's happening in your, your business or in your industry that's relevant for a short period of time. And so therefore you want to post about it uh, and share that with your audience because it's happening now. Um, Maybe, you know, I give the example that you may, if you think of uh, someone who's important in your industry, let's say he's, you know, a thought leader, um, I'll just, I'll say Simon Sinek, he's just the first person that popped into my head. He wrote a book called Start With Why, he's a brilliant, you know, uh, social thought leader about starting with why and, and the importance of that. Now, let's say he, um, he has, a, you know, his basic concept from his book, which is tell people, you know, it's more important to understand why you do what you do than what you do. Uh, you could post that. That's been his his message since he started or became you know relevant to people, and that's true today, tomorrow, the next day. Now he may release a new book, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden he's got a new concept, and you may want to be talking about it when it first comes out. That's more fresh cut. That's happening now. Uh, it, the Phillies sadly uh, were uh, in the playoffs, as an example. So if you're a sports fan and your team is doing well or just lost, whatever it may be. It's something that's gonna you want to share now. That's fresh cut, uh, and I think it's important to have both. The other concept that uh, I love, and I I can't take credit for it, but I can take credit for sharing it, uh, is a concept called play the hits. Uh, my friend Annie Schiffman, who's wrote a book called uh, Simple Social Media, her father was a big executive in the radio space, and he shared this advice with her, which is play the hits. And the concept between play the hits is that if you go and see a concert of your favorite artist, you don't want to hear their new music. You want to hear all those things you love. You want to hear the things that you know and you've come to know. And so I think you take that approach with content. Rather than always feeling the burden and the need to share something new, if you know there's certain kind of content that's worked really well, you can share it again. Because we're all dealing with so much information that the likelihood is that people may not have seen it. So you said earlier, you sharing this content, not for the people who see it a thousand times, but maybe for that new person. I would add to that, that it may be for one of those people who've seen it before. Mm -hmm. And their need for your services may now be relevant and they weren't the last time or the time before. So the need to continually feed the beast, as I like to say, because some people may be ready for you later on down the line and now you're keeping top of mind. And that's why you the traffic I think needs to continue to be fed because you need people all the time to be thinking about you. And I'll give you a really, uh, an example, I think I send out emails, there's a lot of people have email marketing and a lot of people are fixated on the open rate. And I think that's important and you want people to actually open the email you send. But I think there's value even if they don't open the email because they see an email from Bruce. You're now in their head in a way that you weren't, even if they don't click through, they said, okay, I'm not gonna deal with Bruce right now or you know what I would, but if the next time you send out an email, they're like, oh, actually, I need to have some staffing needs. Let me get in touch with Bruce. Now they are going to engage. So it's always, you know, it's a matter of timing. And you don't know when someone's going to be ready. So you need to always be ready. And part of the way you do that is by providing that relevant content on a consistent basis. And so playing the hits is a way of repurposing. I, I always, it's not a one and done. It's not you share one piece of content and then you never share it again. <laughs> Because the likelihood is that only a small percentage of people that you're trying to reach are going to see it. 
And therefore, posting it multiple times is necessary to really expand that reach to not just new people, but even to some people who've already seen it, but maybe not have paid attention to it. Now, I like old school. Okay. Because email, maybe it'll be open, maybe it won't be open. There's no way to guarantee it. The one thing that will always be read is a postcard. Send out a postcard. Now, I had friends and we went to the pharmacy and it was the beginning of December and they bought Christmas cards. And I looked at them, I said, why are you buying Christmas cards now? And they said, Bruce, maybe you're not aware of this, but in four weeks we were, are going to be um, celebrating the birth of our savior. <laughs> I know that, however, in five weeks time, these cards are gonna be 50 to 75% off. And they're going to be the same exact cards next year. The only thing that will change is if Walt Disney or somebody else, Pixar, what's well, Pixar Disney? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Comes out with a new character and you need it for the kids. Other than that, <laughs> doesn't much matter. I thought about it. And then the next, uh, uh, after January, they um, brought me uh, a Christmas card. Um, which I thought was cute. How does that translate in the digital world, in your world? To, so that's again about evergreen content because it's, you know, you can, I, I knew an accounting firm that wrote their Thanksgiving blog in February. And so the way that it impacts is it enables you to do two things. It enables you to back content, to create content that you don't need this moment to plan ahead. And therefore you can schedule things out ahead of time without the need to be like, oh my God, I need to do this today. So because we know certain things are fixed in time, milestones, um, you can plan ahead. And so I think the great benefit of knowing that I can start doing an animation or a post or a postcard or whatever piece of content to celebrate Halloween today. And I can schedule it today for next year, even if I wanted to. Now, you probably want to put up some parameters to check and make sure if you wrote a blog post in February for Thanksgiving, is there anything that's happened between you know February and October that might you might want to tweak it? But the concept is that you can plan ahead. And I think the difference between effective content marketing and less effective content marketing is having a plan. And the plan can mean a lot of different things in terms of, well, what's the type of content that your audience is going to respond to? How can you plan ahead? What are the things that are coming up in the future? So that you can plan ahead and so you're not overwhelmed because I think content can be very overwhelming for people. And I try and stay three to six months ahead. And what that means is the evergreen content, if I'm going to share about holidays or I'm going to even share about my book or I'm going to share about you know certain things that aren't going to change, messages that are consistent for my business, relevant to my audience, I can start to create that and have it ready in the in the hopper, as they say. Mm -hmm. And then when things come up, you can then have that fresh cut content and say, okay, here's something that's happening right now. Let me do an Instagram live or let me, you know, create a postcard for now or whatever. I'm, you know, not there's a whole idea about where you should and how you should be sending it. But in terms of the type of content, you know, the the uh, the um, material that you're going to be sharing, the message you're sharing, mm -hmm. your example showcases exactly how you can plan ahead of time. Uh, I don't know about the digital discount, you know, in terms of, you know, yeah. if someone comes to me and says, hey, can you do me a holiday, you know, a holiday project in January? I I don't think I would discount, but there are some people who have seasonal businesses. And so from that, that regard, it may impact the fact that like, oh, now is a slower period of time. You might change your content, you know, to think about that. You know, mm -hmm. so there are things in the marketplace that you want to consider. But I think, again, it's about having, you know, content, is important because you need to continue to be top of mind to people. You need to continue to connect with your audience uh, on a relevant basis so that they don't forget who you are. Now I have a newsletter on, I always forget. I don't know why it's a mental block on WordPress that has 44,000 mm -hmm. subscribers. And I awesome. have a um, newsletter on LinkedIn 
-hmm. that has 4,400 subscribers. Okay. And it's the same article posted mm -hmm. on each. It's no doubt redundant. I'm aware of that. Um, nobody, I've only had one person in the last months unsubscribe from the WordPress. And every week I get a few more people on the LinkedIn. Now the articles, unless something happens, all right, I already have all the articles written through the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, if something happens, I can change the order. No big deal. I forgot what I was going to ask you. Uh, oh, I did an experiment. And I would send out the articles Sunday morning. Send out means... Post it on LinkedIn, post it on WordPress, then all the LinkedIn groups, Facebook, all the mm -hmm. Facebook groups, et cetera, et cetera. And I get, according to LinkedIn, because WordPress I haven't been able to figure out, even though I've been on it for years, um, I get between worst case scenario 1,200, best case 2,000, and some pick up after time and have gotten to 3,000 mm -hmm. and more. But I only know that when all of a sudden somebody comes out of the blue and contacts me about it. So then I look and see what the number is. Now, I would do that on a Sunday morning. I would um, post it on a Sunday morning. Then I was thinking, well, maybe Friday would be better. Before people are leaving for the weekend, especially in the summertime. Then I said, okay, instead of an A, B, let's do an A, B, C. And then I did it on a Wednesday. It made absolutely no difference whatsoever. Now, I'm one person. What is your experience in what day of the week is best to post mm -hmm. and what time of the day, especially if you're willing to have international clients? Yeah, there's a lot of thinking behind it. And I always think it's really funny if I were to put best time to post on LinkedIn, you'd see lots of different answers. You know, best time to post on social media, you see lots of different answers. And my answer is a little nuanced, which is it depends on your audience and your industry. So therefore, and it really can change. And so I love the fact that you experimented. One of the things I have to t tell people is like marketing is part art and part science. And the science part requires you to experiment. So that you have, you can be informed to make decisions. And so my kind of philosophy has always been the ERA. Now, not, not related to baseball, but the ERA stands for experiment, review, adjust. So that's what you do. You try something different and see what the results are. And then if the results are impactful, then you make a change. So most people would say that on LinkedIn, it's you know a professional service. So they consider that during the week is probably better because more people are likely looking at it. They usually say it's, you know, it's one of those things that people now are checking first thing in the morning. So there are still best practices that most marketers agree in terms of the times that people do it. You know, whether it's lunchtime, some people suggest, you know, between 12 and two, because that's a period of time when people take a break from what they're doing and go check LinkedIn. But the real answer is, you got to test it and then see what your audience responds to. Because just because it may be like, they may take data and say, okay, we've done the data. We've looked at, you know, thousands of different people's posts and the most engagement happens on Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m. And you post it at 12.30 p.m. And then you try it on, you know, Monday at 6 p.m. And 6 p.m. performs better. Okay, well, now you want to try it a few more times. And, and is that, you know, hold up true or is that an anomaly? And so that testing always is something you always, that's why you have to continually review. You know, you can't just expect that you set some sort of marketing and leave it alone on autopilot. If you're not looking over time at what's changing, then you're not going to improve it. And the idea is you're tweaking, you know, incremental changes to your content to make it better. And sometimes a lot of people say, it, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. <laughs> and sometimes I think that's true. That is like, doesn't really make enough of a difference for me whether I post on Wednesdays at 12 or Fridays at three. Probably not going to be the difference between my success and my failure as a business. <laughs> Therefore, I think there are things that you want to consider 
making it more relevant with your audience, understanding who your audience is and what they respond to, whether you do it on Monday, Tuesday, Friday, whenever, I think that is a bigger thing to focus on than, oh, wait, did I get the day perfect? Um, so I don't dis- I don't you know discourage people from doing those kinds of experiments and seeing what happens. But as you just indicated, it made no difference. So for you, your content, it's less relevant uh, around the timing. So now what else can you change about that content to see if it moves the needle or not? Is, you know, have you done A-B testing with headlines? Have you done A-B testing with th- videos or images or, or other things? And so therefore you can look at some other element of that content and see if there's something that may or may not change people's engagement with it. It, Just to answer the question that you didn't really ask, (laughs) a video didn't, I I, I, I tried it with a video, no go. I tried it with a photo, and that's what turned things around. A photo. Yeah, I'm you know, a visual content producer. And I, if you look at the breadth of studies that have been done about engagement, they all say video is the best. That's, you know, that's that's the, but you've just proven it, it may not always be the best. It just may be the best most of the time. You know, I think it's important again. I was talking about including a video on an- I understand. Okay. And it may be the type of thing, so where- when people are looking at a newsletter, mm-hmm. those people are looking to read something. And therefore, the right. video is it's like a disconnect. Yeah. And so it's not that the newsletter is better than a video. It's just that you're cross-pollinating in a way that's not making sense to people. Now, so, I've done it if it, I did one, and I forget what the um, article was about, but the video was of a gentleman at the Oxford Union destroying um, the proponents of climate change. And it was it, it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it may have been about, I, I don't remember what the topic was. In that case, it worked. There you go. So, and, and I think again- everyone, It was at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone is looking for that magic spell that's going to, change the course of their content. And unfortunately, if there was one, there wouldn't be a hundred books on content marketing. There wouldn't be marketing consultants and things that help you with it. And I think it's an art. And that's the challenge with some of people's content is that you need to work it. It's not a one, it's it's not a short term, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm-hmm. And marketing, I would argue, is that because if you're going to build brand loyalty, where customers are going to come back again, customers are going to talk about you to other people, then you have to look at them as a customer for more than just this month or this post or this. And therefore, they have to get to know you a little bit. You need to get to know them, but then they need to get to know you. Uh, and I think, again, it's about figuring out what works for you. That's that's the magic. You know, Keep working at it until you find out what's working for you. And if something isn't working, you know, then discard it. And it's interesting, you talked about a postcard. So I had a, uh, I was working with a client and we were doing all sorts of different um, tactics, billboard, radio, television, digital, and print and, and direct mail. And we were looking at the costs of each of those. And then we were looking at the number of leads we were getting from each of those. And we could track it because we had a separate phone number and a separate landing page for each one of those tactics. Mm-hmm. And I had the job of crunching all those numbers and figuring out what's working and what's not. And in that case, it was a home service uh, company, you know, where they're working in the home. The, the direct mail still was better. It's an older, older generation. And we were like, digital, it's going to be digital. It's got to be digital. And the reality was for that circumstance, at that time, it wasn't. And so we're like, okay, it didn't mean we'd abandoned digital, but it meant that we recognize that making sure that direct mail was as strong as it could be was important because that's how people were engaging. On the flip side, there's the old marketing expression, which is in order for someone to buy from you, they need to have seven touch points. And so the old story goes that in an ideal world, someone wakes up and um, 
here's your ad on the radio. And then they're driving to work and they see your billboard and they get to work and they get an email from you and they come home and there's the postcard. And so it's about that multi-channel integrated marketing that I do think is important, both in terms of consistency and reaching people more than once. It's going to take some time and you have to work it from a bunch of different angles because everyone is different and you, and you can get some indicators, but there's a difference between an indication and a guarantee that, oh, if I do this, this is what's going to happen. Now, I had something rather strange or surprising happen to me. Um, I've been criticized numerous times online. Doesn't bother me. Uh, and you're saying something of interest. There are cr crit critics and there are critics. And those that do it intelligently and take the high road, I enjoy. Those who show that they're um, lacking in um, soft skills, who cares? <laughs> Gentleman contacted me and said, I saw the way you reacted to a person who had uh, criticized your service for seniors. And that's why I'm contacting you. And I said, why? He said, I like the way you handled her. This was a one and done. But it's interesting. Go ahead. You know, yeah. I think especially in the social media digital space, um, things are not always going to go right. And companies and brands are going to have things that don't go well. And the real opportunity is how you handle it. Because I think we recognize that things aren't always going to go well, but how we respond to it makes all the difference. And we've seen incredible examples of brands doing it horribly wrong. And we've seen really good examples of people handling it the right way. You know, the, you know, there's a question of, should you delete negative reviews? I don't think you should. No. I think instead you respond to them and say, oh, I'm, you know, and I've seen it on Trustpilot and other places where they have a, even if I don't think the service is good, they take the time to voice their acknowledgement. Cause that's, I think all, when people complain, they want to, at, at first they want to be acknowledged. And so I think it's really important for you to say, I'm very sorry you had this experience and what can we do to try and make it better? You know, that's the end of the day, you know? And yes, there's a small minority of people, maybe it's not as small as I'd like to think of haters, you know, haters are gonna hate. And so you, you can't control everyone. And so I, I always say, you know, you take the high road and, you know, kill them with kindness and move on. Cause there's just, you know, some people you just can't, you know, yeah, it's just not gonna win. So can't, can't, you know, you can't win with everyone all the time. But I think if you're consistent in the way you behave as a business and you, you know, you stay with integrity and you're, cause this is about your content then you're, that's the way to be. Nefria, I want to show your contact information. Bear with me one second. And no problem. I want to ask one final question. I am prepared. All right. It's not that big a deal. Don't <laughs> worry about it. I promise it's painless. Is there anything that I did not ask you? that you wish I had asked you? And if I had asked you, what would you have said? Well, there's the easy self-promotion answer to that, which is, is there anything you're promoting at the moment? The answer is yes, I wrote a book and I'm excited about it. Um, but I think in and terms the book of the- can be purchased through 9. So Media. If you, uh, no, if you reach out to me, I definitely, it will be on Amazon within the week as an ebook. Um, if you want more information, there's a website, thecontentbeast.co. That is the best place. It'll eventually have all the information. For now, you can put in your name and when it's, if you're interested, and then I'll, I'll get it. Um, and, and your audience, anyone who's interested in, in learning more, I'm always happy to have a conversation with someone, whether it's about video, animation, content, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I'm very welcoming and, and eager to just share my, my passion about helping share your message. Um, 
a question that I wish you had asked. Um, I I don't think there's anything specific. I guess, you know, what's the first, you know, the most important thing I would tell people about creating content? Um, and it's interestingly about your audience. So I came up with a concept called the 11th commandment, know thy audience. <laughs> And if there's only one thing you get out of this conversation, that's the one that I usually share with people, which is stop worrying about presenting yourself as being the best since sliced whatever and start thinking about your audience and what matters to them. Jeffrey, that's excellent advice. I thank you. I thank you for your time and for your thank wisdom you. and your willingness to share it with our viewers. Thanks very much, Bruce. I'm Bruce Hurwitz. Thank you for watching. And as always, please stay focused on success.